This episode is part two in a series analyzing the New Republic. What you're about to watch is not an overview in history of the New Republic as it was, but rather our idea of what it could have been if for whatever reason the Templin Institute was put in charge of its development. If you'd like to understand why we made the changes we did, be sure to watch part one, in which we discuss the ways we felt the New Republic didn't quite work. And because this episode is, at its core, a reimagining of the New Republic, we've made the decision to exclusively use concept art to portray it. Some of the artwork might contain elements you recognize, others might be repurposed, while others still might have never been brought to life. We also reached out to a variety of talented artists who graciously allowed us to use their work. In this latter instance, you'll find their links in the description. So while this artwork doesn't always perfectly reflect our version of the New Republic, it serves as a fantastic starting point. But finally, the Templin Institute did commission one piece of artwork for use in this episode. For more details on how you can obtain a digital wallpaper version of it, stick around after the video. The Alliance to Restore the Republic, long before it adopted that title, was born out of an office in Cantham House, Coruscant. Here, in the tumultuous final days of the Clone Wars, a series of secret meetings were held to discuss the growing power of Supreme Chancellor Palpatine. Those in attendance represented a delegation of 2,000 like-minded senators, and one last attempt to preserve democracy. Yet they acted too late. Within days of the declaration of the First Galactic Empire, many of the delegation's members were arrested on charges of conspiracy and treason. Those who remained were forced to either publicly abandon their opposition to imperial rule or flee from Coruscant, labeled traitors and marked for death. Only a scattered few members of the delegation survived long enough to witness their movement turn from formal protest to open rebellion. Most were hunted down by Imperial agents to be publicly executed. Others simply disappeared. But the spark they had kindled in a modest Coruscant office ignited a fire across the galaxy. In desperate battles across hundreds of star systems, scattered groups of freedom fighters struck back any way they could against the most powerful military regime in galactic history. Their actions, however inconsequential they might have seemed at the time, stoked the fires of rebellion further, until they burned with a deadly heat. By the time it had been officially declared to the galaxy at large, the Alliance to Restore the Republic had grown from a loose coalition of rebel cells into a united and increasingly well-equipped military organization. Where once it had been forced to flee at the first sign of Imperial forces, it could now engage them on almost equal terms, ship to ship, and soldier to soldier. It was a single, decisive strike that brought about the slow yet certain end to the Galactic Empire. If there was any hope the Imperial regime might survive the rebel victory over Endor, it vanished as images of protests on Coruscant were broadcast across the galaxy. As statues of the fallen Emperor were toppled in Monument Plaza, Imperial weakness was laid bare, and its collapse became inevitable. The unfolding drama on the throne world was repeated across thousands of star systems. Victory over the Empire was formally declared a year after the Battle of Endor, and 24 after the first meeting of the Delegation of 2000. To the very few that witnessed the full breadth of the Galactic Civil War, from the secret meetings in Cantham House through to the restoration of democracy, the Alliance had become unrecognizable. During the fighting, the Rebellion attracted mercenaries and pirates, smugglers and bounty hunters, defected clones and separatist remnants, political idealists, and fierce revolutionaries. It was to them that the great task of rebuilding would be given, to secure in peace what had been won in war. This would be their new Republic. That the Alliance would fracture once its immediate goal was in sight was inevitable. While the declaration of a new Republic was celebrated across the galaxy, no sooner had a decisive battle been achieved over Jakku than the nascent Galactic Senate grew divided. With the backbone of the Imperial Navy broken and burning on a distant world, came an extraordinary opportunity for peace. Hardliners argued for nothing less than absolute victory, 
to see every remaining bastion of the Empire's power liberated. But the more moderate elements of the Senate had come to believe that such a victory was unlikely. Even the most optimistic estimates placed it at the very least a decade away. The underwhelming performance of the Starhawk Project, the desire to consolidate the Republic's liberated territories, and the increasingly unwieldy nature of its military placed the outcome of any future offensives into doubt. The Galactic Concordance satisfied neither side. To many within the New Republic, it was too lenient. To the Imperial Remnants, too severe. While the smaller fragments of the Empire were permanently weakened, the larger states were neither pacified nor conciliated. This is no peace, claimed one senator, merely an armistice for 30 years. Yet despite this criticism, the Concordance gave the New Republic what it desperately needed, the opportunity to finally transition from a military coalition and provisional government into a true sovereign state. To what degree the terms of the Galactic Concordance influenced many worlds and star systems to either withdraw from the New Republic or suspend their intention to join has remained a contentious subject. At the very least, it was an important factor alongside a great many others. Within a year of the nation's declaration, it was easily recognizable that the New Republic would be only a fraction of the size of the old. Across the many worlds that had suffered under the rule of the Galactic Empire, the public's desire to again be a constituent state within a larger nation had dwindled. Even planets whose governments had wholeheartedly supported the rebellion and gambled heavily on their victory saw the defeat of the Empire as an opportunity to become their own free and independent states. The disengagement of the Mon Calamari in particular from the Alliance framework was a critical blow and seemed poised to herald a wave of similar withdrawals. The election of Mon Mothma as the New Republic's first Chancellor and the dissolution of the provisional post-war government was a stabilizing element sorely needed by the fledgling nation. Mothma's unique ability to bind together both the old guard that had served during the Clone Wars and the multitude of reformist groups that had come to dominate the Senate proved decisive. Her fiery rhetoric and passionate appeals to the public turned her first major initiative, the ratification of the New Republic's constitution, into an all-encompassing, unifying effort. Her success here brought renewed legitimacy to her government, proving to both the New Republic's citizens and independent star systems that rapid progress could be achieved. Following the adoption of this new constitution, national reconciliation was seen by Mothma as the primary task of her chancellorship. She worked with former Imperial administrators to convince them that they were equally protected and represented within the New Republic, and delicately addressed the criticism this association drew. Through the so-called Forgiveness Campaign, Mothma prevented the mass exodus of former Imperial loyalists who still held important positions in many of the nation's most critical industries and infrastructure. The rapid rehabilitation of the New Republic's economy compared to other independent post-imperial states would largely erase any further criticism of the program. Mothma's second term was marked by her campaign against a cabal of oligarchs that had amassed enormous wealth through the private acquisition of formerly nationalized industries. She stunned both her adversaries and supporters in an uncharacteristically brutal countermove, eschewing negotiations and compromise in favor of government seizures and even arrests. While her actions were by some interpretations of the New Republic's laws not entirely legal, the power of the oligarchs were completely broken. The role of Senator Leia in the seizure, once it became public knowledge, would make her a popular figure within the Senate and a favored pick as Mothma's successor. Ultimately, the astonishing revelation that Senator Organa was the daughter of Darth Vader, the Empire's most lethal and hated figure, ended her chances of assuming the chancellorship overnight. The startling information, together with the suspicious circumstances through which it had been revealed, is believed to have contributed, at least in part, to Chancellor Mothma's decision to run for a third term. While her victory was nearly as thorough as her previous two elections, her declining health reduced her involvement in the day-to-day -day affairs of governance. Mothma's last major political success as Chancellor was the establishment of the Galactic Alliance. 
This was a supranational institution, meant to provide a new framework through which independent star systems could associate with the New Republic and be given a pathway to membership should they choose to do so. Through the Alliance, dozens and then hundreds of independent star systems began the process of entering into a single internal market, a monetary union, and sharing a common security and defense policy with the New Republic. If any member of the Alliance was attacked, the New Republic would be obligated to come to their defense. Although far smaller than the Old Republic at its zenith, the Alliance was seen as a hopeful first step in binding the wider galaxy together again. Her success abroad was diminished slightly by an uneven record domestically. Chancellor Mothma considered the establishment of political parties within the Senate something she had long argued against to be the greatest failure of her chancellorship. In multiple speeches, she warned of the potential for distraction and agitation that would enfeeble the public administration with ill-founded jealousies and animosities. The death of Mon Mothma in the final year of her third term was seen even by contemporaries to mark the end of an era for the New Republic. Through her bold vision and her ability to bind together disparate groups, the New Republic had come to possess a constitution and government recognized universally by its citizens. It had expanded its presence across the galaxy, and with the establishment of the Galactic Alliance, had embraced strong ties both with longtime allies and new partners. The elections that followed were dominated by the new alliance, united, and outer rim bloc political parties, and began a period known as the Revolving Door Chancellorship. Ponk Gavrisum, Borsk Failure, and Hera Syndulla were each elected to single terms, building on the foundations established by Mon Mothma, but failing to sustain the coalitions necessary to keep the Senate from falling further into partisanism. The hot crisis during the time of Chancellor Failure represented the greatest threat to the New Republic since the Galactic Civil War, culminating in the bombing of the Senate and the wartime deployment of New Republic forces for the first time. The occupation of pirate hubs in the border territories grew unpopular both within the Republic and abroad. The intended shock and awe campaign instead exposed the weaknesses of the New Republic defense forces, and the initial invasion degenerated into a low-intensity but perpetually mismanaged police action. These forces would be withdrawn under Chancellor Sindula, having failed to achieve any meaningful result in curbing the rise of piracy. Under the administration of Chancellor Sindula, the New Republic attempted to focus on the expansion of its soft power and reinvigorate trust in both the government and the nation as a whole. A series of grand infrastructure projects were at the core of her chancellorship, including the restoration of the Quat and Fondor fleet yards, a series of trade stations along the Hydean Way, and the creation of a new galactic capital. In orbit of Talceta, an uninhabited world selected for its symbolic and strategic location in the Mid-Rim, a new space station would be constructed. Designed to echo the size and scope of Starlight Beacon, or even the Imperial Death Stars, this station, when completed, would become the new center of the Office of the Chancellor, Republic Senate, and the nation's other major governmental institutions. Despite Sindula's enthusiasm for the project, construction would not begin until the first term of her successor, Leneva Vilchem. Widely considered to possess the same talent for building coalitions as Mon Mothma, Chancellor Vilchem supported major reinvestments into the Galactic Alliance and the first successful inroads into the historically turbulent trans hydean borderlands. His appeasing nature, however, is thought to have contributed to the growing presence of fringe parties within the Galactic Senate, including neo-separatists, populists, centrists, and actionists. The Rally for Liberty Party especially gained a significant number of seats during Vilchem's second term, despite its open adherence to the tenets of the First Order, a rapidly spreading authoritarian ideology. The rise of the First Order became the most significant geopolitical event in recent decades, and one that the New Republic was initially slow to address. Across Imperial rump states, independent star systems, and even within the New Republic itself, factions aligned to the First Order fundamentally disrupted the status quo. Often going by many different names, these groups advocated the centralization of power, the militarization of society, and actively downplayed many of the worst aspects of the Galactic Empire. Faced with an increasingly deadlocked Senate, and a Chancellor unwilling to confront this ideology, 
the First Order gained major footholds in countless star systems. Critics, first among them General Leia Organa, argued fervently for action, leading to several public condemnations of Chancellor Vilchem and the New Republic's government. Indeed, the government that replaced the Galactic Empire is in many ways far different from the Republic first envisioned by the Delegation of 2000. Even to those who fought in the rebellion to restore it, the New Republic of Reality bears little resemblance to the New Republic they had dreamed of. It is a government of compromise, an equitable agreement to its proponents, a half-timid measure to its critics. Yet it is these compromises that have allowed the New Republic to remain a coherent whole. A federal republic consisting of a vast number of sectors, territories, and other constituent entities, the New Republic is in effect a supranational union. It binds together a myriad of worlds and governments through the free movement of peoples, goods, services, and capital, and is endowed with a single currency and common practices on trade, security, and regional development. Any world might join the New Republic, so long as it meets the Chandrillan criteria, defined during the first term of Chancellor Mothma. These require a stable democratic government that respects sentient rights and the rule of law, the total abolishment of slavery, and the acceptance of the obligations of New Republic membership. The Chandrillan criteria have been expanded and grown more complex as the New Republic has evolved, and the path to membership can now take years or even decades. In direct contrast to the Old Republic, the three branches of its government are wholly independent as part of a larger separation of powers. Chief Executive Authority is held by the Office of the Chancellor, directly elected by all eligible citizens to serve a four-year term. While no legal limit exists on how long a Chancellor might serve, precedent established by Mon Mothma has created an informal limit of three terms. In addition to directing the New Republic's administrative functions, the Chancellor is the supreme commander of its armed forces. Assisting the Chancellor is the New Republic Council, composed of the heads of state or government from every member world. Originally an informal institution, the Council has only ceremonial power and is instead responsible for defining the overall political direction and priorities of the New Republic. Its members rarely meet together as a whole, Instead, individuals or groups within it regularly advise the Chancellor on issues concerning their constituent worlds or regions. The New Republic Senate is the nation's unicameral legislative body and the largest political institution in the galaxy. Consisting of tens of thousands of directly elected representatives, it makes federal law, has the power to declare war, approves treaties, provides stipulations on the use of funding, and has the authority to impeach the Chancellor. A wide array of Senate committees and subcommittees, both formal and informal, exist to address specific duties, issues, or territories. The growth and autonomy of these committees has fragmented the legislature's power and further divided the Senate along party lines. In a sense, the Senate is not a unified institution, but a collection of semi-autonomous groups that occasionally act in unison. Judicial authority is held by the Supreme Court of the New Republic, tasked with interpreting federal laws and their equal application across member worlds. The overlap of federal laws with those of the New Republic's member states have created a narrow and complex jurisdiction in which the Supreme Court can operate. It is the highest court in matters of New Republic law, but not in those of its members. The New Republic currently maintains no permanent seat of government, but instead a rotating capital. This is usually, though not mandated by any law, the homeworld of the elected Chancellor. The process of relocating every major government institution, especially during the revolving door Chancellorship, has made this policy deeply unpopular within the government itself, but remains nominally supported by the general public. Upon the completion of Triumph Station, however, in orbit of Talceta, this will become the fixed center of government. The relationship between the Federal New Republic government and its various members permeates through every level of its society. While each member world shares the same basic tenets outlined in the Chandrillan criteria, there is enormous diversity in the expression of those tenets. In a concerted effort to overturn the xenophobia that flourished during the reign of the Empire, the New Republic has heavily promoted cultural cooperation between its member states. 
Organized sports, national orchestras, artists' awards, and various cultural policies have been established to facilitate integration. But the most successful of these programs has been the New Republic Capital of Culture. At the start of each year, the New Republic designates one of its worlds as a cultural capital and organizes a series of festivals and other events with a strong focus on unifying and uplifting themes. The competition between member worlds to be named the cultural capital has become one of the New Republic's most celebrated traditions, with each world selected endeavoring to outdo its predecessor. In addition to the immense social and economic benefits, selected worlds have undergone significant urban regeneration and seen their image and profile raised on a galactic scale. Official events organized by the New Republic have been accompanied by side festivals and unofficial gatherings organized by corporations or even private individuals, effectively creating a never-ending celebration, slowly making its way across the galaxy. While the New Republic's cultural integration had been widely successful, the progress of its defense and security policies have been mixed. The New Republic had initially attempted to distance itself from its militant origins within the Alliance to restore the Republic, and instead rely mostly upon its member worlds' respective armed forces. The lack of a single combined military had been one of the New Republic's most successful policies, but one increasingly at odds with the developing galactic situation. Imperial remnant states beginning to challenge the restrictions placed upon them by the Galactic Concordance, and First Order-aligned militant groups acting with increasing sophistication and capabilities across the Outer Rim have forced the New Republic to reconcile its strained relationship with military force. During the Chancellorship of Hera Syndulla, numerous initiatives were launched to help bridge the gap between the New Republic's armed forces and New Republic society. The trauma of the Galactic Empire's occupation of what are today the New Republic's territories created a widespread distrust of military values, even among those who served in the Rebellion during the Galactic Civil War. To repair this relationship, public military displays, once associated with the Imperial regime, have slowly returned across the New Republic, not intended as demonstrations of power, but rather to encourage the public to examine what military service means within a democratic nation. Within the armed services themselves, a governing philosophy centered around inner leadership has been adopted at every level. Professional soldiers are not trained to be faceless tools of the state, as they were under the Empire, but citizens in uniform. Their overriding purpose is to defend, on the basis of their own convictions, the values of the New Republic with the dignity of life above all. Orders without any legitimate aim, those that violate a soldier's own dignity, or are unconscionable, do not need to be followed. While orders that violate another's dignity, or constitute some manner of crime, must be refused. Under these new principles, the New Republic has undergone the first sizable rearmament and modernization of its armed forces since the end of the Galactic Civil War. The New Republic's federal military is organized under the New Republic Defense Forces. They are composed of the planetary-based New Republic Army, a New Republic Starfighter Corps, the Interstellar New Republic Navy, and the paramilitary New Republic Ranger Corps. Still relatively small compared to the forces mobilized during the height of the Galactic Civil War, they have nevertheless been systematically modernized and represent the best equipped military institutions within known space. The New Republic Army is by far the smallest of the service branches, composed of a headquarters unit permanently assigned only a single legion. It is almost ceremonial in nature, periodically given command over a rotating selection of military formations from a variety of member worlds. The only permanently assigned unit is the Corellian Coruscanti Legion, which evolved from the variety of forces assigned to guard the Corellian-run hyperspace route and now serves as the nucleus of the New Republic Army. It has never been deployed to an active combat zone, but instead mainly serves as a way for different military units across member worlds to interact and gain experience working with one another. As a result, the New Republic Army contains no heavy walkers, artillery, or other forms of support, and is primarily a light infantry formation. Despite this, it operates at a level of constant readiness, the only branch in the defense forces able to rapidly deploy to a combat zone. This is largely symbolic, however, meant to prevent member worlds from ever having a monopoly on the use of ground forces. The New Republic Navy, by contrast, is far larger 
and the only branch that approaches the size and capability of its predecessor within the Rebellion. Unlike the Army, it is an entirely permanent force, consisting of several sector fleets spread across the breadth of the New Republic's territory. While the size of each fleet varies significantly, each formation is based around large fleet carriers able to accommodate hundreds or even thousands of starfighters. The most advanced of these, the MC-CR-108 Endor class, is by far the largest warship ever put into service by the New Republic, surpassing even the Super Star Destroyers utilized by the Imperial Navy. While capable warships, they were designed to be equally useful during emergencies equipped with extensive power plants, water treatment facilities, and medical units that can support or replace planetary infrastructure during a crisis. Only the largest sector fleets contain an Endor class, and they are rarely deployed independently without at least an accompanying task force. The workhorse of the New Republic fleet continues to be the MC-95 and MC-85 Star Cruisers, initially designed by the Mon Calamari but produced and modernized domestically within the New Republic. These are routinely accompanied within New Republic task forces by the smaller Nebulon and Vakbar lines of frigates and transport vessels. Within the New Republic Navy are numerous component services, the largest of which are the Fleet Starfighter Arm and New Republic Naval Infantry. The former is the sister service to the largest Starfighter Corps, while the Naval Infantry is responsible for landing ground forces on planetary battlefields. Although the capabilities of the modern New Republic Navy are far greater than the old Rebel Starfleet, despite its smaller size, the Defense Forces have maintained a distinct Starfighter branch. In many ways, this independent Starfighter Corps is the true successor to the old Alliance Navy, consisting solely of various Starfighter wings that were once at the core of the initial rebellion. Operating from planetary bases or orbital stations and exclusively utilizing starfighters with onboard hyperdrives, the core is a dedicated attempt to preserve the exceptional institutional knowledge obtained during the Rebellion and instill in its pilots an aggressive, daring attitude. The New Republic Ranger Corps is distinct from the other major branches, expected to fulfill certain civilian duties as well. Resembling the Starfighter Corps in its exclusive use of snub fighters and smaller patrol vessels, the Rangers are equal parts pilots, law officers, and bounty hunters. They operate primarily outside of New Republic space, deployed mainly to independent star systems in the Outer Rim territories that lack any formal government. Together, the New Republic Defense Forces represent only a small fraction of the armies and navies present within the New Republic. Instead, it is the planetary defense forces that are mainly responsible for providing security and deterrence. The structure, capabilities, and scope of these forces differ significantly from star system to star system, government to government. Some, such as the Corellian Defense Forces, the Royal Naboo Security Forces, or the Coruscanti Guard, approach or match the federal military branches in their sophistication, but most are underfunded and under-equipped suited mainly to deter piracy elements and ill-suited towards any large-scale conflict. The inability of most planetary defense forces or even the New Republic Army to fight and win a sustained conflict has led to the reintroduction of volunteer groups into the New Republic's defense forces. Under New Republic law, any corporation, private business, or individual able to raise, train, and equip a volunteer force can lead them as a fully sanctioned military unit. Although a controversial decision at the time of its introduction, hundreds of volunteer groups have been established. These are theoretically under the command of the New Republic and able to be disbanded if they do not adhere to certain standards. But the constant need for security forces across the Outer Rim means these groups can operate almost completely independently. A lack of oversight has contributed to several public embarrassments for the New Republic in which undisciplined, unprofessional volunteer groups proved incapable, or no better, than the criminal elements they were supposed to confront. Yet, in other cases, they have been the source of surprising successes, destroying slaver groups, disrupting spice rings, and other destabilizing elements to which the New Republic could otherwise ill afford to dedicate its resources. The nature of the volunteer groups has attracted a unique kind of Republic citizen, and even more so than the planetary defense forces, these groups differ significantly. 
Some of the most famous volunteer groups include Clan Tyrell, a force of Neo-Mandalorian Crusaders, the 34th Droid Legion, scavenged from Separatist ruins, the Flying Blurgs, composed of smugglers and freelancers from Nar Shaddaa, and even a company of AT series heavy walkers under the command of a former Imperial general. But it is the first New Republic volunteer group, known as the Resistance, that has had the greatest impact on galactic affairs. Founded by General Leia Organa, it has attracted both veterans from the Rebellion and those who grew up idolizing them. Unlike the other volunteer forces that take work wherever it can be found, the Resistance is dedicated to observing the movements of a new power believed to be operating in the unknown regions. They have been clandestinely supported in this by New Republic intelligence services, who have been tracking the Imperial remnants that have seemingly aligned themselves to the ideology of the First Order. Yet, just like the Delegation of 2000 that came before them, they have acted too late. A weapon replicating the power of the Death Star has reduced Horsnium Prime, capital of the New Republic, to ashes. The Chancellor, the Senate, an entire sector fleet, and billions of New Republic citizens have been reduced to ash. At the same time, armadas of warships bearing the distinctive emblem of the ancient Sith have appeared across the galaxy. A great war has erupted, and the New Republic is unprepared. Already, the cracks in its foundation have widened. Entire star systems have announced their succession, hoping to strike a separate peace. Planetary defense forces have been routed or destroyed, and the advance of the Sith is nearly unopposed. But on a distant world in the Outer Rim, the Resistance has been saved by a figure of legend, humiliating the designs of the enemy in front of the entire galaxy. The images of a lone guardian facing down the wrath of the Sith have been broadcast in every city, every town, every outpost, and the fires of rebellion are burning once again. For each world to surrender or secede, another has mobilized its forces. While entire units have fled the battlefield, others have fought to the last soldier, refusing to give up an inch of ground. The volunteer groups have formed the core of a new grand army, and already they are resisting on a hundred worlds, reinforcing the beleaguered defenders. Rather than abandoning their patron, the Galactic Alliance has expanded, welcoming old allies and new partners that have flocked to the aid of the Republic. And within a hidden citadel, a new emergency government has been proclaimed, announcing to the universe that however long it may take, they will accept nothing less than absolute victory. And above all, a rallying cry once forgotten is again ringing out across the galaxy, as tens of millions march to the defense of democracy with the words, For the Republic. Thanks for watching the Templin Institute's version of what the New Republic could have been. We tried our best to create a credible and interesting variation of the Republic, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Which version of the New Republic do you prefer? Is there an area where we succeeded or failed? And who would win? Our reimagined New Republic or our reimagined First Order? There is a poll in the description where you can vote on just that. And if you'd like to get your hands on the artwork we commissioned for this episode, it is available on our website in HD resolution with a 4K variant exclusively on our Patreon for every $2 pledge and above. Again, you'll find the links in the description, and thank you for your support.